Hey, welcome to our review of Barbenheimer. This is part one. We're going to talk about the bomb movie. Ha, ah, there's so much. To I, I will say. Yeah. If you're going to go do a Barbenheimer. Yes. Objectively, the best way to watch it is Barbie and then Oppenheimer. I completely it agree. It elevates Oppenheimer because it makes everything much funnier. I had no idea going into the two movies that I would be, I would come out more stunned and awestruck by Barbie than <laughs> Oppenheimer. Like, I'm I'm very confused. I did not realize it was a PG-13 movie when Me I went either. into yeah, it. Yeah, as soon as they said their first heck, I'm like, oh, what's happening? They did a cuss. Oh, wow. They, they talk, know you could do a cuss. Yeah, they did a general joke. I can't believe it. Wow. So, yeah, so this is going to be our Oppenheimer review because I want to get a panel of people. I feel completely unsuited to mm -hmm. review Barbie. There's yes. so much in that movie that I am I'm not uh, capable of Yeah, if of you reviewing. weren't an ally before, after you watch Barbie, you will become an ally and you will not be allowed to talk about it. I think it. it's required reading it's for required every 13-year-old. For every 13... Mm -hmm. If you're... At all in middle school or high school, yeah. you have to watch this you movie. Must. Yeah, it's, and it's then written you must directly have, yes, for you. Yes. It's very good. But yeah, I don't feel remotely qualified, so we're having a panel of guests. One that is a um, Barbie aficionado, mm -hmm. and the other that we saw. I call her a, saw, ba a Barbie scholar. A bar Barbie scholar, mm -hmm. yes. And the other that is your a beautiful wife, that we went and saw it together. And the entire time, <laughs> I just kept turning and was like, there's so much of here that I don't understand that you are... <laughs> yeah, I just kept apologizing to her the whole time. Yes. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, yeah. I'm sure at some, some point you felt this way. <laughs> Today, we're going to... Do the other thing, which bald men with beards can do adequately, which is talk about World War II history. Yes, like wow. every middle-aged father of a millennial. Speaking of which, we, we took too our dad. know too much about World War II. That was the mm -hmm. first time we've gotten that man yeah. to go to a movie in literally two decades. I was very surprised that, like, usually he's like, no, I'll pass on movies. But he wrote, like, yes, please, with an exclamation point when I said, do you want tickets? I know. So I amazing. know. I was there. How dare you quote the sacred text to they me? They weren't I was there, there was you piece of shit. What the fuck are you talking <laughs> about? What is this? Like, oh, I was there. I know they weren't. That's why I said it. I was to tell you, we grew up together. <laughs> Damn it. So, yeah, so Oppenheimer. I want to start off with some behind-the-scenes stuff because there was some interesting stuff relating to this movie that, like, caught headlines like they did and, in fact blow up an entire nuclear bomb exactly. and kill mm -hmm. a lot of people just to like for authenticity they did mm -hmm. the craziest part they didn't show it they just showed the entire um it was off screen all the yeah. actors reactions mm -hmm. to that it was exactly. crazy yeah. yeah and then they cgi'd uh, a big explosion i'm kidding because apparently there was no cgi whatsoever during this movie according to christopher nolan i would argue hard in the opposite direction i don't know they have a they literally have a bunch of models of like particle physics yeah but how that's is not... that particle cyclotron thing supposed to not be cgi movie magic you goofball elaborate i have no idea but i presume it's like i'm a sorry long i'm not exposure. a dark wizard like no, you th but that's what i love i want to see this is the first movie i think i've seen in a long time where i want to see the dvd box set of it that's this thick that has so many dvds or blu-rays or whatever of behind the scenes of how they achieved some of the visuals because there's one picture that came out of um, Hoyte van Hoytma, the guy that is like the IMAX guru that helped, uh, I think he was the DP on this movie, of them creating a camera that could perfectly shoot this explosion and showing this like Junji Ito's Uzumaki spirals in front of them like a Lovecraftian horror and it's just like, I don't know what I'm looking at, but there's people on the production set, so I hope they're okay. I hope they don't have radiation poisoning now. I'm excited to see what the fuck that was about. Like any of the pictures that came out. Do you think they actually just blew up a, several kilotons of TNT? I Legitimately, I am curious if they got the clearance to just mm -hmm. do a nuclear explosion. They just made a big pile. Yeah, if, yeah, exactly. You got fireworks left over after 4th of July? Send them to us. Perfect, yeah. I don't even know what to say about like some of the, some of the visual in, the, in this movie are so good. So I'm very excited to, I don't know, get some of my other friends' opinions on that because having gone into the movie and known that like they said there's no cgi the entire time i'm like i could see how you could get some of these shots i don't know most of them yeah this is like when star wars was like how did you make this exactly. in 1970 whatever yeah. without cgi yes so another thing i want to mention about the filming of this movie is apparently the camera they used is meant it was developed to film like, nuclear explosions like they made a new one it was something prism camera and it shot at 2,500 frames per second. Knowing that makes a lot of the images you see in my mind make more sense, but at the same time, 
so much of it is like different angles of like explosions and stuff that made me think like how many times did they do this explosion to get all those in spe those specific moments or did they make one camera with like a bunch of different sensors and elements that all perfectly captured this explosion from eight million different angles at once and they only did the one take yeah it's just a bunch of mirrors so the camera just like all the different <laughs> angles they just like zoom in on the mirror yeah perfect yeah, yeah that's it no but nuts that actually, not that, that I love that image in my head. That's just a sensor on a bunch of mirrors. Yes. That's good. That is what a camera is. <laughs> yes, basically. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention about like kind of the inception of this movie, Inception, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, I wow. wasn't sure if you were doing that intentionally totally until the third didn't. time you did it. I'm sorry. So off the back of the movie Tenet, like they had just finished filming it and apparently Robert Pattinson and Christopher Nolan had been talking about Oppenheimer because there's like a quote about Oppenheimer. In it. And on the at the very end of that, during the rap party, Robert Pattinson gifted Christopher Nolan a book. I thought you were gonna say an atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you. Don't don't spend it all in one place. Don't throw it too hard at the wall. <laughs> yeah. He gifted him the American Prometheus book, which this movie is based off of. And apparently, like Christopher Nolan immediately just started writing stuff. He couldn't stop thinking about it. And now here we are. You know that new movie idea? Well, listen <laughs> to <laughs> this. <laughs> um, also, that apparently on the set of Tenant, that's where Robert Pattinson learned that he would be Batman for the Batman movie. And Christopher Nolan was part of the like committee that would approve that decision and so he walked on to set and before anybody else knew except for robert pattinson he went over and like gave him a little shoulder bump he's like congratulations and then went across filming they told nobody else about it because it wasn't public information yeah no that was the craziest part of this movie was all of the scenes of the like senate hearings were actually a metaphor for the big panel that they had. robert pattinson had to go through to become batman well i'll have you know that that was actually uh an easter egg that each one of the council members is a member of the batman's like rogues gallery yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, My favorite there's... part was when Two Face was like, "Well, what does this bomb mean for America?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love. And the Joker was like, yeah. "We've entered a new world with no rules." <laughs> oh, that was great. Was it Eisenhower? Was the... yeah. Was oh, okay, Truman? no, no, no. Truman. Truman. Yeah, yeah, Truman was the one when he like when they did the big bomb. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's played by Gary Oldman. Yes, and that yeah. was, was very Chef's good. Kiss. Yeah. That that is the that in my heart that's Truman. Just a big trashy piece of junk. Yeah, jowly boy. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I love the moment when Truman came out and was like, you merely adopted the bomb. I <laughs> Actually, so, yeah. that brings up a good point. I, I know that you probably heard this controversy about the movie, and I, I remember when I saw it in the movie, okay. I was incredibly upset. They like allude to General Groves, and he walks on screen, yeah. and you see Matt Damon, yeah. and everyone, I remember in the theater, unanimously got together and was like, oh my god, that is not thick enough. General Groves <laughs> is a thick boy. Oh if you've God. seen photos of this guy, he is like when the bomb went off, his cheeks were clapping. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. This dude was dummy thick. He is oh one God. half of the dynamic duo, and they did him dirty. And I want people. I Cameron is going on record yeah. right now. Wildcard Cameron. Mm -hmm. I stand for a thick yes. general groves. <laughs> we stand a thick groves. We stand a thick groves, um, yes. I do love the moment when Matt Damon comes out and he's like, fortune favors the bold. Here's a cryptocurrency. Do you mm -hmm. think about this Oppenheimer? And he's like, what the fuck yeah, are you no, talking I about? Yeah, no, I never thought to use the blockchain to blow up a, yeah, a wow. Japanese city. And they look at the camera and then they thumbs up yeah. and there's the crypto.com Yeah, the that was logo. very confusing product placement. I guess that's what it takes to get an explosion on screen like that. Maybe we should actually talk about the movie yeah, with let's... some modicum of seriousness. Okay. I need to talk about this really quick because okay. I don't think there's any other time that I'm going to mention it. The Last Voyage of the Demeter, mm -hmm. the trailer, mm -hmm. I can't get over this fucking trailer because it starts off as like, wow, a cool period piece about people on a ship. And they're like, there's a creature on board. And then you're despite all my rage. <laughs> That's the moment where I was like, this is awful. This is, yeah. this, this is like every single mistake you could possibly make about a horror film. They show the monster yeah. several times yeah. in all of his forms. Mm -hmm. I, there's no interest. I have no curiosity. What I, I just love how it starts off is like, in our mother tongue, we call him Dracula. The world is a vampire. <laughs> Sorry, you were drinking. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they basically give away the ghost. The only way that this movie could get more interesting, having seen this trailer that presumably spoiled the entire movie, is if Frankenstein shows up and we do a Dracula versus Frankenstein thing in a completely dour and serious boat movie. This reminds me of Dracula 2000, but like... What the fuck did you say? Dracula, was it Dracula 2000 or Jason? I'm trying to remember. There's like a Dracula in space. There was and they Jason have, X in no, space. No, no, no. This was Dracula in space. I distinctly okay. remember because they stab him with a pool cue, and because the pool cue is made of synthetic wood, it doesn't work. This is incredible. 
I need to watch this. This movie is exactly the sci-fi middle of the day schlock you think it is. Forget Oppenheimer. We're talking about this movie now. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. all I remember from it. So now we're done talking about it. Okay. So I think that was everything about anything else relating mm-hmm. to the movie. So let's talk about the movie. Yeah. Uh, broad strokes. What did you think? I think not enough infidelity, too many explosions. <laughs> not zero out of 10, not my you know, Oppenheimer. <laughs> frankly, I thought the opposite. Too much infidelity, not enough explosions. Yeah, well, you would think that. I would. Because you, you've never boy. been a big science man, apparently. Nope, nope. I'm not a big physicist. I did not. Here's the, my one, like, my one actual criticism with the film is sure. I know more than enough, like, yeah. professional scientists and acad- like people with PhDs. Sure. They are the sassiest people you've ever met. Yeah, right. There's no way that only Emily Blunt's characters in those depositions being a sass factory. Yeah, they finally get some some representation up on screen and he's just sitting there meekly being like, I didn't mean to do it. Well, Oppenheimer himself isn't supposed to. Like, that is the part. Is like, he knows sure. he's... He is trapped. He is. Yeah. This is this is how it, it was Dune for me. Yeah. Because he is trapped, and he knows that every move is going to lead him to the same outcome: a jihad in his oh name, nuclear fire, stop thousands of people about dying Dune. in my name. I'll never stop talking I about hate Dune it so much. Uh, well, yeah. And by the way, so we're spoiling history right now. So this is just stuff that happened in history that I was surprised they were going to go in this direction. I think it was pretty good. We'll get into deeper stuff about it, but overall, yeah, the framing device of the movie is kind of looking back on his life, which I think was pretty good. It was a good I think. Way to put that the easiest way to think about this movie is yeah. yes objectively it is a biopic biopic however you sure. want to mispronounce it mm-hmm. of a person with a very complicated history so obviously it's going to be anachronistic they're yeah. not going to make groves thick enough all the things <laughs> that you would normally complain about in the same way that tenet literally has a line that says it's don't think about it feel it sure this movie is exactly that there are entire parts of this movie that are not about thinking about the creation of an atomic weapon, but mm-hmm. feeling the anxiety that comes from creating such mm-hmm. a devastating world. I completely agree. The only quiet moments in this movie where there isn't a backing track are meant for tension. Mm-hmm. The rest of it has a like droning... Sa- that's, like, that's the genius of it. Yeah, yeah. The, the point, that is intentional. That droning sound is supposed to be like, and this the worst part was seeing it in Dolby IMAX because you were just like, your we did We saw it in just regular IMAX. That was Dolby. No, I wanted it to be in Dolby because they have the reclining chairs Why that I actually enjoy. Why was it so loud? Yeah, I was really surprised. My like, head it was, shook everything. My brain was rattling in my skull. It was so loud. But Seriously. that's the point. It's yeah, like yeah. that droning bass is supposed to be the anxiety yeah. everyone feels around nuclear holocaust. Not mm-hmm. just then, but still now. Yeah. Like every time he's imagining just a nuke randomly going off, killing everybody. I think about that. Yeah. The movie does a very good job of that, of mm-hmm. like kind of wrestling with the ideas of that. If you're paying attention, mm-hmm. I hate to say it, but in my mind, I, I did the stupidest thing and saw that IGN gave it a 10 out of 10. And so that primed my brain to be like, oh, all of the things I want to happen will happen. Mm -hmm. That's not how this works. So there were parts of the movie where I, I've read the Wikipedia articles. I've read the articles about Oppenheimer. I've read some stuff about him. I think he's a very interesting guy. I know a good amount of the factoids about him, but my God, was there so much in the movie that I'm like, if I didn't hear what you just said, I wouldn't feel horrified. Like in my mind, there's a particular moment where they talk about, I mean, spoilers, Oppenheimer, Help develop the bombs that bombed he Hiroshima. Did what? <laughs> you see, you weren't paying attention. I wasn't either. paying attention at all. But that's, the that's, music was so good. But this is exactly what I mean: is that they spoilers helped create the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so there's only one line in the movie. It's a small conversation where they talk about the actual aftermath of that explosion, how many people died, and what happened. That's it. I wanted them to go deep in it. I wanted them to like really show the horrible stuff. And this is just a disclaimer that I don't really do that. Like minor spoiler, but I'm just like, I know that they, that's not the point of the movie, but like I wanted Christopher Nolan and Hoyte van Hoytema to show me the most disturbing thing that's happened in World War II besides the Holocaust. Okay. And they didn't. Two, two things. Yeah. One, Oppenheimer is not war is bad. It's Oppenheimer. I know. It's about Oppenheimer. Sure. If, if you put me on the camera. If you don't know war is bad, you need to know <laughs> war is bad. I'm just telling you, there's nothing else to this comment. War is bad. We didn't need to know that going into this movie. The movie is about how Oppenheimer felt about creating something that if you think about it was supposed to be used on European soil, not Asian soil. Oh yeah. To bomb Nazis, yeah. not Japanese. 
and was used at a like I literally did my IB paper yeah. on why we dropped the bomb. Did you really? We, yes. I didn't know. And that. it was an examination of you have the Potsdam conference. Are the Japanese actually ready to surrender or not? Yeah, yeah. You have Russia is starting to become an aggressor in a post Nazi Europe. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we drop the bomb because we actually want to stop this war and bring our boys home? Mm -hmm. Or is it, did we drop this bomb to flex on the Russians? Yeah. Or do we drop this bomb to let the entire world know there's only one power left and we are it? And if you want to see an actual anti-war movie, go watch Barbie. <laughs> Two, <laughs> this is the second very important important mm -hmm. thing. Important. Yes. Hiroshima and Nagasaki yeah. are Oppenheimer's Uncle Ben. We don't need to see Uncle Ben uh. get shot. We don't need to see with great power comes great responsibility. We know war is bad. We know Hiroshima and Nagasaki was bad. If you would like to learn anything about what happened there, there's too many YouTube videos about it. So we did not need it. I just felt like that could have been a pretty good way of us visually seeing his guilt in a separate There's a way besides the visions he has. middle-aged dad demographic the History Channel caters to. That is 90% just slow motion playing the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb explosion. Just so you guys know, I went to the Hiroshima Museum in Japan, so I have a soft spot for how horrible and terrible and awful it was and would love to see that on screen and you're a monster other people. <laughs> this is not making you look no good, i but. want other people to experience how fucking disgusting and terrible it was and and how bad bombs are in a visual medium besides one guy's guilt you know but that's the second problem with oppenheimer is there's no way to make people understand the horrific nature of a nuclear weapon and so that's why they didn't play that like they would talk about it but that's the problem is all we have is talk like we have two horrific events in history where bombs were actually used on people yeah, but it's not the same in terms of like getting people to clearly understand a nuclear weapons impact on people. We have pictures. Cameron. Yeah, I wanted to see a picture. You're a monster, <laughs> you goofball. Well, in particular, you got to see Oppenheimer looking at pictures. <laughs> that this is the moment I'm actually talking about. <laughs> is that deliberately they have a, they're they're showing like a roll of whatever the like slides of stuff, and they have pictures of presumably on a projector, and it just zooms in on Oppenheimer's face while he's like, oh. Oh, gross. Oh my God, I did, oh, I helped do that? Oh no. And I'm like, you could have showed us the pic, so we feel bad too, you goofus. So anyway, that's that was probably my biggest critique and that's just because I was really impacted by that museum, really impacted by how fucking terrible that shit is. And yeah, if you guys want literally an image that will freak you out is that during the explosion, some of the buildings remained, but it was so hot that people were vaporized and the only thing left was literally their shadows on the ground. Like, it's horrible. So This seems so divergent from this movie. <laughs> but that's what I mean. It's about nuclear holocaust. I feel like imagery of that would have been a bit more poignant and they do have some but yeah i didn't feel like they they went far enough in my opinion uh considering everybody said like this movie will fuck you up walking out of barbie i was more shell-shocked <laughs> yeah that that movie deserved to be an 11 out of 10 if ign gave that a 10 out of 10 yeah seriously and the one other thing that i wanted to mention about oppenheimer in general terms and i told you guys right after the movie is that this was christopher nolan's hamilton like this was christopher nolan in the same way that like Lin-Manuel Miranda did Hamilton, it was like, it's called Hamilton, but all the big players are everybody else around him. And he's just doing the most interesting stuff. Every single time a historic figure shows up, they go, hi, I'm Ed Teller. And like, it's fine. I don't hate that. But like, that was the whole movie. When anybody like introduces themselves, I'm like, this is a guy you could Google later. And it's great. And so I think that this was weirdly enough, like, Christopher Nolan's stab at that kind of like, here's a historical bio, a biographical telling of like an era. And we're using one guy's, one very interesting person's perspective to get everybody else that's a little less charismatic and a little less controversial and weird of a person to cover for an entire movie. Although I would argue that Alexander, did he kill more people than Oppenheimer? Who's to say? Objectively, no. Yeah, but yeah. the other thing is that, like, the entire center of it is the moral conundrum of his. Like, he does so much stuff for science. Yeah. And the moral conundrum is the fact that he was instrumental. Yes. This was his human instrumentality project to create <laughs> the atomic bomb. Yeah. I think that this is a good time for us to go into spoilers because we've kind How of. How do you spoil a movie no, no, about history? There's part of the presentation style that I think can be spoiled and would be a disservice to the audience. A lot of the stuff we've talked about is just historical fact. 
So this is stuff that you might have learned about in uh, high school or that you might know from reading an article. There's a really good Veritasium video that kind of encompasses some stuff around Oppenheimer that was good to like know beforehand, then go see it and be like, oh, cool. These are the things that they talked about. But I think that there is a quintessential Christopher Nolan style of storytelling in this movie that I was surprised happened because the, the entire movie, like we said, kind of just goes barreling through. This needs to happen fast. Here's us telling, like, there's so much to cover in this that we just need to go from person to person, time to time, like grab all of the pieces, sprinkle them in. But in particular, Christopher Nolan is known for, and we have a video about this, for his this whole time element of storytelling, where something you learned early on in the movie that you forgot about, will come up later and be very important about this story in particular. So now that we're in spoilers, primarily the framing device of Lewis Strauss, mm -hmm. um, the entire idea that he is now up for, he's, he was nominated for He's nominated Congress? for a cabinet position, okay, and he had to cabinet. be confirmed by Congress because yes. that's how things work when the government decides to not get hung up on wokeness. Yes. So we start off with his perspective about Oppenheimer, and that's what gets us into Oppenheimer. But then we circle back to that later, and we see how this relates to everything. Like this small thing that you're like, how the fuck does that have to do anything? Finally comes back, and you realize like, oh, okay, this kind of recontextualizes a couple things. Well, I also liked the way that like Christopher Nolan, I mean, I've not seen him do a lot of historical biopic stuff. So yeah, Dunkirk is the only one I can think yeah, of. Yeah, I like the way he kind of mashed together certain things, like the apple. Also, if I had a nickel for every single time a famous World War II scientist tried to poison someone with an apple, I'd have two nickels, which is not that many nickels, but it's kind of weird to happen <laughs> twice, right? Wait, is the other one Turing? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he poisoned himself. Yeah, it was himself. Yeah. yeah, but the point is, there was no reason. Bohr was not there. Yep. Nothing about this interaction had anything to do with Niels Bohr. Exactly. Like, that, that was a microcosm of the film. Sure. The film is winding up to an, a, a bomb. Like, it's the, oh, what's his name? Um, Hitchcock and the bomb. Uh, thing yeah, the, about like you uh, know your ticking clock. Yeah, yeah, but we didn't have to tell anyone. You know it's a bomb. Yes, Oppenheimer's yeah. entire life is about this bomb. So you're literally spending the whole movie waiting for a bomb that you mm. did not need to be told about. Yeah. And the same way the apple scene is a microcosm because he literally uses science to make something to poison someone he doesn't like, mm -hmm. and then he's about to watch it be used to kill someone he admires. That's a good point. An innocent person he admires. That is a microcosm for the philosophical quandary of the entire movie. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And also, it's a green apple, which is my favorite kind of apple. That's a good apple he wasted. It's a good-ass apple. Yeah, I'd eat it. I don't care if there's potassium cyanide <laughs> in it. I'll eat it. And in particular, similarly, something that I thought was interesting in a kind of interstellar inception kind of way is a lot of the visuals they use early on for Oppenheimer, like, visualizing particles in the universe. I feel like we're basically like foreshadowing for the actual bomb. Like a lot of the same imagery that they use then will be represented later in the actual bomb that happens. So kind of showing that the cyclic el element of like his brain's or always been wired to get to this point. And it's just an eventuality that it'll happen and all of the other dominoes were in a row for it to lead there. Well, actually, so this is an interesting thing about history. Um, Einstein was kind of the same way. So both Oppenheimer and Einstein, they were, okay, when someone tells you, like, Einstein failed math or whatever, like, that yeah. person is full of shit. Einstein yeah, was, happen. like, a revolutionary mathematician. Mm -hmm. But he did not like doing the math yeah. in the same way that Oppenheimer did not like doing the math. But they were both, they had an incredible way of feeling physics mentally. And that, like, going back to my point earlier about how in Tenet they said, don't think about it, feel it. Yeah. That is why I thought was very clever about those visuals inside his mind. Is like yeah. that's how that's how you feel physics. It's not useful for me to be like, oh, this is an electron cloud around a nucleus, and this is what it's supposed to mean. It's like this is like the weird, shaky anxiety of a person trying to imagine what an atom looks like, mm -hmm. having no concept of what an atom looks like ever. There are lots of the, like you said, there are lots of those little things that prime you throughout the movie. Like my favorite thing was the entire point is having something happen mm -hmm. and not feeling the consequences until later. You see it happen. Yeah. And so they start this with the bombs. They set off the like bombs that they're going to use for the implosion device. Oh, yeah. So you can see the explosion happens and then you hear it. Yeah. And that primes you for when the nuke goes off. When yeah. the nuke goes off, you see it and they spend forever. Like a long time. Like they, they milk the heck out of that suspense until finally just the most earth shattering bone rattling bass noise washes over the audience and you're like i can't believe i didn't bring earplugs to this it's a metaphor yeah for the entire thing the bomb went off and we're still waiting to hear the 
societal explosion that comes from the implications of the weapon. That's a good point. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. You're surprised by it. And while you're watching the movie, you're just like waiting for the shockwave. You know it's coming. And you're just like, what? I, I don't know where we are in time when like that will shatter my ears yeah. in the movie. And they describe this movie as a thriller. And I feel like that's those are the elements where you're just like, when's the other shoe going to drop? This mm -hmm. is freaking me out. So they do an incredible, like, man, yeah, you're right. That sound design was like super bassy, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, like the entire theater was rattling and we weren't even Dolby. And there's also this like crackle they use the whole time that gives you the sense of like a Geiger counter going yeah, yeah. off, which mm -hmm. gives you that like radiation is not something you can see or even really feel. It's just sure. hurting you without you knowing it mm -hmm. in the same way that this, the implications of this are hurting you. Like it is so milked into the themes and motifs of this movie yeah. that you can feel that anxiety in every element. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. Yep. And the one other thing is the element of when you have the like it sounds like a train like revving up noise where it's like a chugga 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 thing and then we find out that that's actually foot stomping from the rally after they've exploded the bomb like after the moment after they've done the most like horrifyingly existentially disturbing thing he's trying to like rally the troops and be like we sure showed them Oh my God. And so like all of the noise of everyone around him is like, it's it's funny if you've ever been very overwhelmed in a situation, they're just like, I just wanted to be quiet right now. And it's not, and I don't know what the fuck to do. And this is terrifying. The anxiety, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that he starts to visualize in his head because like you said, he couldn't have seen Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He doesn't know what it actually looked like, but he's visualizing like, oh my God, like this is even worse that I don't know what it was like. And this is... All of these people in this room could have been destroyed the same way. I agree. They didn't show the scale of how horrifying Hiroshima and Nagasaki was. But when he steps on like a charred cadaver, I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, here we are. This is yeah. this is the disturbing part. As well as someone else's skin is the peeling off their face. The skin's peeling off. They turn to ash. Yeah, there's yeah, a scene yes. where they're there and then they're suddenly not there. And there's like this particulate effect all over the room. Yeah. That's very clearly them having turned to ash from the explosion. Sure. Yeah. Something I actually thought was funny about the bleachers is I thought the bleachers were going to be a reference to the fact that... You see it at one point in the movie, those scientists, the Rami Malek and those other scientists with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was under bleachers in like a college stadium. Like was it? students did not realize when they were going to rally events, they were getting low key irradiated by the first stable fission reaction oh, that we use right. for, yeah, that we use for nuclear power plants. Oh no. Yeah. Cause yeah, it, yeah. like the only difference between a nuclear bomb and a nuclear reactor is in how many neutrons are let off. If it's a stable stream of neutrons, mm -hmm. then energy is slowly being let off at a stable rate. And you yeah. can actually control Like what cobalt does is it absorbs that neutron. This is some deep science stuff. I hope you came here for deep physics. I also took IB physics mm -hmm. and also am an engineer, so I know physics. I am. I can I build the physics. Mm -hmm. I built a particle collider while I was trying to make a bowl of Kraft mac and cheese once because the instructions were not clear. I do need a gush for a second. Cameron in middle school made a robotic arm just to like... I made that in elementary school, you disrespectful bitch. Did you really? Yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. So yes, this is why I had him on. I built an electric golf cart for my senior design project. <laughs> this is why I had him on. But... Cobalt. Yes. So that's the thing. Cobalt can absorb those neutrons. Okay. But then the nuclear bomb is when you have further refined uranium-235, it lets off two neutrons. And so you have a binary exponential event mm -hmm. or not binary i just i know what you mean yes two to the things. power yes. of n two to yes. the power of n explosion okay. yeah and it can get worse and then there's the hydrogen bomb part which is also like they use uh that that was supposed to be so they allude to this and i'm glad they didn't focus on the super or of yeah. later they didn't even i don't think mention our no but those were like the hydrogen bombs i was like oh no yeah. We did, in fact, do a bad thing. We made an arms race. I think historically, like, the, the last time in this movie is in the 50s, like, mm -hmm. late 50s. And I don't, did, I don't think the Zarbombo was made then. I, no, I, I, that I nuclear know. bomb blast, I think, is implied to be Zarbombo. Uh-oh. The other funny thing is because of the nature of how you're supposed to be able to store, I don't remember if it's deuterium or tritium, the, the specific heavy hydrogen component they use for fusion bombs. If you've ever seen a photo of Zarbamba, it's like a house on stilts. It's like, this one, there's like oh, a no. shack where they put the bomb. They have an entire house. Like you are not delivered. This was before they were able to miniaturize the technology. So the first hydrogen bomb test, someone built basically like a three, two house on stilts and oh, put God. a bunch of crap in it to explode. Jesus. Yeah, that's what they're talking about when they're saying that the hydrogen bomb is impractical because mm -hmm. you'd have to be like, you wouldn't be delivering it with a plane. You'd be delivering it with an ox cart because it's oh, too yeah. heavy to move. Oh, that's yeah. what they're talking about. 
I misunderstood what he said when he yeah, said that. Yeah, that's because yeah. you're not a student of physics and history. You're not the person the Barbie movie was made for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this movie, similarly, just has so many of those moments where you're just like, how do they cram so much in here? To the point where, yeah, there are like j moments and quotes that you're just going to miss that actually allude to so many things in history. That's really interesting, and especially that they allude to other stuff that will happen later. Like Ed Teller was mm -hmm. just like, hey, I want to like pursue the hydrogen bomb. Will you back me? And he's like, no, I'm not. I don't like bombs anymore. I thought I didn't I, like bombs in the first place. He wanted to do atomic physics, knowing yeah. full well what that would bring. And the, the guilt riddled him to the point where he's like, no, this is I, I'm staunchly against these and don't want them anymore. And they did a pretty good job of kind of showing, weirdly enough, the life cycle of uh, someone that devo like devotes their life to science, but then it gets used for whatever. Like immediately the climax of the movie is them showing the, the bomb. Like you get to see it in all of its glory with all of these incredible cameras and everything. I would argue that the real climax is when he's in the um, president's office and he's talking about how bad the bomb was and Truman literally just like, this moment's not about you. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one that yeah, pulled the I trigger. Dropped the bomb. Yeah, I dropped the bomb. No one cares yeah. that you made a bomb. Mm -hmm. They only cared about who used it. And yeah, exactly, that like right after the bomb goes off, they take it from him. Like, it's a philosophical it's climax of the film, is that you've created this thing and put it out into the world and now you have no control over it. I agree, yeah, it's not about the horrors of nuclear warfare. It's more about the horrors of People. scientific yeah scientific endeavor being taken away from you like you yeah. don't get the right to dictate what happens with the things you make the, the same thing with albert einstein like when he gives the quote at the very end of the movie that technically is also at the beginning of the movie it's delicious yeah it's such that was another one of those christopher nolan nuggets that's that what i mean repaints everything yes yeah that was like that when you were bringing that over i thought that you were gonna talk about that because that was just like that is such a chef's kiss, like Einstein passing the torch. Yeah. Because this is the funny thing is he's doing a Christopher Nolan to Oppenheimer, where he's like, you gave me an award once, and I don't think you really appreciated what that award actually meant. Mm -hmm. It didn't have nothing to do with me and everything to do with all of you. And yeah. you know, one day they will give you an award and feed you fish, yeah. and you will understand what I meant. <laughs> yeah, and how much of it is you spend all this time and effort, your entire life's work, to do scientific advancement that gets taken away from you in whatever they, whatever the people funding you is. And then after you've done that and created something that could be the most disturbing thing on the planet, give it enough time and people will forgive you for having created this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll remember you more for the achievement and less for its horrific implications, right? And they do that in a very good way, showing that like, we start off the movie at this point in time when Straws is trying to, I mean, spoilers, this is a big spoiler. Straws is like, wow, I don't know why everybody's being so mean to Oppenheimer. That doesn't really matter because I'm trying to get this seat in the cabinet. And so they're, they're questioning him. He's like, yeah, what's going on with Oppenheimer? He's like, I don't know. I don't know why anybody would be so mean to Oppenheimer. And we see that he's being indicted and has this like month long uh, investigation against him about his communist uh, past, all of these other things. And then at the very end, we see Straws set that up so that he could take his anger out on um, Oppenheimer because I, after reading some stuff, there was a bit of other things besides the fact that he basically made a mockery of him and showed that like, oh, Straws doesn't even know what he's talking about. He can build a bomb out of a can of beer or whatever. Yeah. Well, no, he's saying every single thing you use to make a bomb yeah. isn't actually part of the bomb. Yeah. The sandwiches you eat, the beers you drink, the pencils you use to draw the schematics mm -hmm. are all part of making the bomb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why is this one thing like this is this also goes to his like kind of communist back. Well, not communist, but socialist background sure. of like everything is part of something. And so yeah. as a result, you can't just like say, oh, this what like it's it's a very interesting like the entire movie, I think, is a very interesting refuting the like individual can always do the job thing because sure. this is. I was something I was worried about in every biopic about every famous person ever is that they just make it seem like this one person was just amazing by themselves yeah. and they solved the problem and nothing bad ever happened again. And this was like very clearly like Oppenheimer is clear that he knows the limitations of his mental acumen yeah. and he surrounds himself with the people who fill in those gaps. And that is a excellent examination of not just how science, like he's not just using scientists. Mm -hmm. He's you like, he's like every single person here can help us. The wives can not just be wives, they can help with the like typing. And also a lot of them are like 
professional like chemists and biologists they can help with the actual research there's yeah. no reason for us to be like the entire reason the nazis couldn't get there is because they spent their entire time talking about how people of different or being anti-semitic and negating yeah. people's technical achievements simply because of their background whereas we're seeing oppenheimer in the same breath as a lot of the lines where they're talking about how the nazis are dumb actively pulling people who would yeah. otherwise be discarded because of anti-Semitism. And he even says the reason they're going to win is because of anti-Semitism. Yeah, because Heisenberg in Germany was be, being given far less resources than they were. And so he's like, we have a head start because we actually value the people here. Yeah. And in less tactful hands, I could see this movie being directed by somebody else being called Straws vs. Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. where like you'd be like, oh, I kind of have heard of Oppenheimer. Who's Straws? Well, this movie lamped like kind of like puts that away in the shadows where straws is a career politician slash like he was an admiral in the war and that it's more of yeah that kind of valor putting adorning yourselves in medals while oppenheimer is like no i did this because of all these people and in the end all of those people come to his aid to convince a kangaroo court a court that was already like we don't like you and we think you're a piece of shit to be convinced that like you are actually a pretty patriotic American. Mm -hmm. You know, if we push comes to shove, we agree that we could trust you with that, but we are not going to give you this clearance because that's kind of the whole point of yeah. the kangaroo court. So it was interesting seeing, like you said, like that dichotomy between selfish, I guess, in so many words, person who is trying to like game the system to the point where his attorneys that are there with him are steps behind his plans. But then that all backfires because he's a piece of shit and people will come out and say that about you versus Oppenheimer, who's like, I was a, a stand-up guy, yeah. Yeah, I'm a stand-up guy in so many ways that the movie portrays him. Yeah, course. except for the infidelity stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that's the other thing is, is the movie is also low-key an indictment of the Red Scare in post-war World War II America, sure. where in the same way that we criticized the communists for like every single piece in public propaganda where they're actively putting people on trial knowing full well what the outcome is mm -hmm. this is saying like the americans were no different sure they just simply called well, it something else yeah yeah mccarthyism's entire angle was we don't like you because of all sorts of other reasons but we're going to use communism as the excuse to get rid of you yeah and yeah. to which there was a spy and it was nobody that you suspected the yeah. entire movie shows you i mean if you had googled it you'd know but like the entire movie yeah by the way if you read the straws wikipedia article it's basically this entire movie yeah like we see the personal life of oppenheimer we see how these people could be affiliated with this or that and they could actually be spies and they're like oh you didn't know this one british guy was actually the spy this other guy you would have wouldn't have suspected was actually the spy and how little of it is left up to your own judgment and just what the other person is hiding. You know, you have no idea. They yeah. wouldn't telegraph it. Well, the other thing is Straws is also a microcosm for the Manhattan Project. Straws is a guy collecting engineers to make like this standout thing that he gets to show off as being the guy. Yeah. He is very much taking on that Truman role. Now, I do want to quickly touch on yeah, the on. most circle jerky moment of this movie. Oh God, okay. There, There is a moment, I don't remember which character says it, where it's like, someone has to tell this story. And then I swear to God, like Christopher uh, Nolan, like peeks his head into the camera yeah. <laughs> and looks directly into the lens. It's just like, it's me. I'm doing it. And I'm doing it better than anybody else would. And I'm like, you know what, Christopher Nolan? You're right. But that's actually the moment that makes me think this is going to win like a Best Picture Award. Look, uh, the we told an important story about history and Hollywood is an, as important as everything else. Yep. And I, I'll say that, yeah, Killian Murphy did an incredibly good job. Killed especially me. having seen some interviews with Oppenheimer later on. Being like, yeah, no, he not only looks like it, but is kind of showing off that kind of like deep voice, chill guy that just is very clever and smart. But in particular, the one moment that I was very surprised the way that they framed it, and the one thing that I think everybody kind of knows about Oppenheimer is the one quote, I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Apparently Oppenheimer had uh, yeah, an interest in so many languages as a young man. And so he was himself translating the Bhagavad Gita. And so what they did actually have was a moment where Gene, his uh, lover, when he was younger, just like opens the book and says, what does this mean? And it's a little ham fisted, but it's like, that's the quote. Now we have some framing for it. We know what's going on. And it's funny because it also starts off with like him straight up saying like almost the whole quote, where he's like, well, that's part of Hindu scripture where uh, Vishnu is. And she's like, no, shut the fuck up. What does it say? Yeah, <laughs> like read the it, words. Yeah, yeah. Which kind of is also lampshading the fact that 
not many people remember the context of it, which I find very interesting because the way that he describes it, and I've listened to the clip like 8 million times before watching this movie, is that this was a moment where Vishnu is like revealing themselves to a prince to kind of show off, say like, you need to do your duty, I'm showing you my power, and then like reveals themselves and says, like their many armed form, he says, and says, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, as an intimidation tactic. And I think that that's very poignant, and of course he meant it at the time, but especially for this movie, that you're showing off your horrific power. Mm -hmm. You're showing off that if you don't do what you're supposed to, what we think you're supposed to do, this is what you will rot. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, horrifying. And it's a very interesting moment that like, I don't know if I just never thought about it until now, but it's so poignant that the entire movie is building up to a moment of, well, we've created the most destructive weapon on earth, now we are giving a superpower, the United States, the ability to go intimidate the world and show its many armed forms and show that like, y'all better not misbehave. Yeah, like they yeah. literally say, we're going to drop the first one on Hiroshima to show that we have this power mm -hmm. and the second one on Nagasaki to show that we can keep doing this until yeah. you give up. All day. Now, I do need to point out one thing about the Gene character. Sure. If I had a nickel for every time Florence Pugh played a character that <laughs> got cucked because she wanted to be with someone she couldn't be with in the year 2023, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's kind of weird it happened twice. What's the other one? When she plays Princess Irulan in Dune Part 2. What's Stop, good? please. <laughs> that made me, like, that was the other part. As I just kept turning to I'm making, like, low-key Dune jokes every God. time she was on screen. I can't believe she gets her own podcast yeah. in Dune Part 2. Los Alamos. The desert. <laughs> There's a single drop of water. Yes. <laughs> Except the, for the big storm. The most dangerous thing is hidden in the desert. Yeah. It's Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the movie is incredible. And I was surprised how quickly three hours went by, but also moments where I was just like, oh, this could move a little bit like, maybe not faster. It was just, yeah, it just felt like it kept barreling, but I was surprised about the editing style. Like we said, there's just this like music going throughout the entire movie, but that there have been movies that have come out this year that are shorter and have a quicker editing pace that just felt really odd. For me in particular, the one that came to mind was like Indiana Jones, where the original Indiana Jones had these big wide shots and you'd see it and it have this momentum. And then this one, they kind of just kept cutting from thing to thing. Well, this movie cuts from time period to time period. They're stitching together all of these different ideas to try to create a cohesive whole so that you are in the mind space of what they're talking about. Right. They go from him talking about like particles in his bedroom to then his indictment, then back to him enlisting people. And that all works because the ideas are similar and you have now an idea of where they are in time. So when they go back to it, it makes sense. While a lot of these other movies can't really make that work because instead of this movie seamlessly putting together like themes and ideas because of that editing, it's just, well, we need to get from point A to point B. This yeah. movie had a lot of direction and idea of where they wanted to go and why. Well, another clever thing about the way they shot it was yeah. all the scenes of like Congress and stuff are yeah. in black and white. That's, I think that's to imply their historical nature and that they are fact. I agree. They are, there's transcripts and documentation of exactly what happened in the public record. And then every single time something's in color, that is the, like that's the director saying, no, it's not Oppenheimer's perspective because there are scenes where it's not him. It's yeah. literally just like, this is potentially anachronistic history. This is the best oh. we can do of these classified conversations and these classified situations based on the first and second hand accounts we got after the fact. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. on the record, off and the it, record. And so visually it helps you paint how you're supposed to take in the information of like, this stuff probably happened this way and this stuff mm -hmm. probably didn't. Like there's no way we would ever find out what happened inside those closed rooms, yeah. top secret hearings where there's literally, the prosecutor's literally just being a dick. He's like, I can't show you any of the material because it's classified, but also you're going to jail. I do love that whenever they talk about it, it's just like, well, who's leading the indictment? Uh, Roy, what was it Roger Rob or something mm -hmm. like that? He's like, oh no! <laughs> like he's like the big bad. Everyone villain. knows Roger Rob. Yeah, exactly. No. So first thing you learn in elementary school is about Roger exactly. Rob, this big meanie well, of Roger Rob. He's like, well, your lawyer's going up against Roger. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. And yeah, they had that really. God, I love that moment with uh, his wife, where she's mm -hmm. just like cutting into the guy because. I, uh, yeah, I appreciate the entire time. She's just like, why aren't you fighting? Like, come on, you're you're more clever than this. And that we get that moment at the end where Albert Einstein is just like, be their martyr, be their whatever. They'll get over it eventually. That's what I had to do. And that that's basically what he's doing. He's like, I get it. This isn't, this doesn't mean anything. You guys are stripping me of something that uh, I don't technically need. It's going to hurt me 
horribly, but eventually it'll be fine. I just need to suck it up. But then his wife is just like, no, 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 I'm, I'm gonna take the piss. I know my perspective here. I know what I can do. And especially that I, I it was, oh, ooh, it was just one of those moments where like, it doesn't translate on paper, mm -hmm. you know? Her like calling out that he's like, you're wording this shittily. You suck at this. It's just like, oh yeah, take him down a peg. Even though that doesn't really like in a transcript mean anything, it's and it would sound like you just don't understand him. Like in person, it just tears into him. And it's so, mwah, it's so good. I, I think honestly, like that's like a example of like perfect casting. I think Emily Blunt mm -hmm. killed it. Hell yeah. She's both incredibly unlikable. Yeah, in in a way, like yeah. that she's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like you've seen every single scientist come in here and just be a bit of a dick. Yeah. And just watching her take the piss out of this guy is just like so cathartic. Oh, it's delicious. Yeah. And similarly, they kind of achieve, I would consider this editing similar to like everything ever all at once, where they keep swapping between all of these different worlds, all of this different time, but they're telling the same arc. So they'll start a deposition of like Groves or somebody. And then they won't even finish it until the very end where it's like, okay, we need the the big punch of like what he said, what that led to in the end. And yeah, it, it was punctuated very well with the wife just being like, fuck you guys. We know what you're doing. You're pieces of shit. It's fine. And everybody else that did come and we're giving des depositions that early on felt like a betrayal. Later on, you see that they're just like, this is just it. Like, I can't do anything else, but we do still respect you. And that everybody that's coming to this deposition has no ill feelings towards you. We're all, we all get it. We all get what the fuck this is. It sucks, but we, but we feel you. Versus Straws, who's up there and immediately like, the, the only witness I remember besides Ed Teller that comes up is David Hill. And David Hill's played by Re uh, Rami Malek. And he's like, this guy fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Here's all the reasons why he suck. I can list them out very easily for you. And it just like d dismantles his entire defense or whatever, like his entire perspective. And it's incredible that like one dude just being like, here's receipts, fuck you. Mm -hmm. And then leaves while everybody else has to like struggle to try to defend Oppenheimer and doesn't even work. Also, I, I don't know if this is like a writer around me, Malik's contracts. In everything he's in, there's always like a scene of him like awkwardly like standing up into frame. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and like when that happened, like, a hunch, like yeah. yeah. Like when that happened, like that's all I could see. Yep, it's exactly. just like Rami Malik doing that. <laughs> It, it's funny how much of this movie in the trailers is like, oh, there's Josh Peck. Josh Peck's gonna drop the fucking bomb. <laughs> like, I was picturing like Drake and Josh like yeah. laugh sound effects over every Drake, time he was did there. did you hit the payload door button? Yeah, what like, payload door button? Like, I'm sorry, I'm sweaty. I don't know what to do. It was next to my Okama game sphere or whatever. Wait, no, that's from South Park. Yeah. I think they had a different game sphere. Uh, the spherical. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then they also had Huey from um, uh, The Boys. Yeah. And like all of these other celebrities that's kept like sprinkling in. I'm like, God, there's so many historical figures that keep fucking pulling out of the woodwork. My favorite, and I had to turn to you to confirm, was the guy from Sex Drive. If anybody's seen Sex Drive, the like horny comedy from the 2010s like to 2009. Yeah. yeah. He's one of uh, Oppenheimer's star pupils mm -hmm. that gets drafted into the fucking army because he's a communist. Yeah. Like, Jesus Christ. That'll teach him. As well as the Green Goblin is like Oh, yeah, a the mean Green general. Goblin is a yeah. mean... Uh, he's not just a mean general. He was... Oh, wait, no, not him. The other guy was like, he literally shot communists during the Bolshevik oh, Revolution. Oh, yeah, that was really good. Yeah, yeah the uh, guy Pash from... was the um, character's yeah. name. The, act, the, the historical figure's name was Pash. I know the actor you're talking about. This really was his movie of just like, let me grab every actor that's ever been in any of my stuff and also actors that are just kind of cool that I've mm -hmm. seen around. And also, they had Polka Dot Man show up to be the guy that really fucks over Oppenheimer and writes this crazy, long indictment of yeah, him. Yeah, he's um, literally Peter. Or Piter. Piter? Yeah, he's the he's the Harkin and Mentat. Oh god, I hate you so much. You said I you wanted some Dune, Dune references, baby. I said nothing on the song. Well, sword. I brought it. Okay. But yeah. What that... am I gonna do with all these Dune references? <laughs> I brought all these Dune references <laughs> in with me. I can't hold them all. I was very surprised. After the bomb goes off, I'm like, what do we do now? And then it's like, oh, here's a Christopher Nolan movie. Oh, here's the prestige. Oh, here's like it just so many of his other movies shined through of like, oh, here's his storytelling. He kind of needed to get the bomb out of the way like to get every, there. Every Pixar, like when Pixar invents like lighting and then <laughs> hair, this is like Christopher Nolan invented good storytelling <laughs> and practical effects. Mm -hmm. But here's the real question that I think everyone needs to figure out. And we're going to get shirts made for this. Um, yeah. Which bomb do you stand? Do you stand gun bomb or do you stand implosion bomb? I stand gun bomb. Gun? Wait, what? The two nuclear bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy. Yeah, yeah. One is gun bomb. It is literally just a big thing of uranium shot at another thing of uranium 
like a gun. Oh my god. Like that's my favorite thing about that bomb because it implies if you throw uranium hard enough, it'll just explode. I, I don't even know what to do with that information you've just given me. Uh, the one thing that I just keep going back to considering how much he brings it up in the movie is how often I'm like, you're being very silly when you keep saying that not only Teller tells him, he's just like, the hydrogen bomb is also doable. Mm -hmm. We know how to do it now. He keeps saying, he's just like, well, don't worry. After this, there'll be no more reason for war. And then Teller's like, until they build a bigger bomb. I'm like, how did you not think about that, you goof? And so, The bomb yeah. that you are actively researching, the bomb that already has a code name. Yeah. And that he also mentions to everybody, he's like, we got a four year head start in the Russians. Literally the next, I think this was actually historically like within the next day or two, there's a press briefing that's like, we found the Russians have a very similar bomb. We just went and looked at it and apparently Strauss was one of the, the first people that's like, we need to monitor them like actively. However, was like, don't worry about it. There's, nah, they don't even know what they're talking about. And of course, it's hard for the Russians to get their hands on something that is very similar to what we have without people thinking, oh, the guy that developed it probably leaked it in one way or the other when it could be parallel thinking mm -hmm. as well as another spy because there were other spies so this really turned into a weird spy thriller but also a historical telling of yeah how how things just get away from you how yeah. something you've spent your entire life on who knows who knows what the public will think of you like hamilton a little bit a little bit about hamilton and i really hope that more biopics are like this because there was this history buff part of me that was really like so happy watching it because every single like factoid I had about Oppenheimer just kept appearing on screen in like rapid succession. The apple, him talking about his time at Cambridge. It, was it Cambridge? He was at Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. That's where uh, he met Heisenberg. Yeah, the stuff about his, Heisenberg, the stuff about his professor. As that kept happening, the more I just kept like leaning back in my chair like, yeah, this is great. I love history. I'm so happy. And I hope that more biopics do that instead of just filling it with some filler of less interesting things, because history is pretty fucking interesting. The history books that I like the most are all killer, no filler. There's very little of like, well, you know, he this or that or blah, blah, blah. He might have thought about this while like it's just telling you like, no, this a lot of shit happened. I don't even think I have enough time to tell you. Yeah, so, that's, that's why yeah. I don't like the Hamilton musical, because Aaron Burr is like the ultimate supervillain and they barely even actually get into how he's a supervillain. God, right. Like Do he's such <sighs> a supervillain. Y'all need to watch our video that we made about that in like a couple it's years not, ago. It's amazing. It is full of the fact that, yeah, like Aaron Burr is such a piece of shit, but especially there's so much in Hamilton that they didn't include because it wouldn't be as flattering. Like the slaves. Yeah, exactly. But also that like, it just wouldn't have made as much sense because you're trying to squish all of things, things together. Just like we said that like Niels Bohr picks up the poison apple. That didn't fucking happen. The dude, the, the professor I think did get poisoned, but no, like- No, the professor never got poisoned. Oh, okay. He found out sure. that the apple was poisoned yeah. and his only because his parents were so affluent was they yes. able to make the argument to yeah. not have Oppenheimer expelled and sent back to the States. Yeah, but this movie has such a benefit of being able to like so in time, it's a movie, they can cut between clips of wherever, that it made it more accessible to just smush together all of these facts. So much so that I really don't think I can like, I gotta tell you guys, Cameron, of course, and my family probably had the worst movie going experience ever because I was constantly taking notes of like everything that was happening. And I think this was the most notes I've ever taken in a movie for one of these. So much so that I don't think it's worth me going through them because it would have just been me rattling off all the things that happened in the movie and how good they are. The one of the things that I, the thing that I did want to mention, her, like while he's rallying the troops and being like, ah, they're not gonna wanna fight us again. Oh my God. And he's like sweating and everything's happening and he's having a mini panic attack or a very big panic attack that it's, incredible similarly to the joker movie where you can't tell if he's laughing or crying half the time it's very well acted from joaquin phoenix that similarly for a lot of the scientists in the audience audience you can't tell if they're like happy ha or sad yes except for right? the one guy outside throwing up yeah that's just like dude what the fuck did we do mm -hmm. but also that like everybody inside is like cheering and losing their minds and everything and it's like they're speaking in tongues and it's like a religious event that it's like so interesting and that you have him just like up there like I don't know what to do, man. Like, this is a lot to take in. And that you have that, like, juxtaposition of, like, the most celebration and the most mourning happening at once. Incredibly good scene. Which is also, like we said, punctuated by the horrors of a nuclear holocaust. Of people being vaporized and turned into ash. So, 
a good way to end this episode. Yeah. Um, thank I, you guys I, for watching and sitting I, through this. I would like to encourage everyone that every Father's Day from now on, we in, we start uh, observing a new holiday I call Poppenheimer, where we all gather God. around and we all watch Oppenheimer with our dads who watch too much History Channel so that they can feel like that year worth of watching History Channel was worth it. It really did feel like an entire seasons of a History Channel retelling of something Yeah, my favorite part was when the aliens showed up and talked about how to make the bomb. Oh, God, no. All right, now we're done. No, we're done.